Hello everyone and welcome to Top Tips for Archaeology Graduates. Today I'm joined by Adam, who is a team leader in the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government, which means he is a civil servant. Hi Adam, how are you this afternoon? I am very well, thank you very much. I've had my hair cut, so um, I feel a lot better. <laughs> We're coming out of lockdown now, everyone's getting like, access to hairdressers um, uh, and to getting to meet up with, with people, but we're still on Zoom and I'm so glad that you've taken the time to join me today to talk about your experiences of working in the civil servant, of being an archaeology graduate and then going on to work in that area. I wondered if you could talk a little bit first about your day job, what are some of the kind of things you do as a team leader um, within uh, the department that you're working in? Um, and what are some of the best bits and some of perhaps the more challenging aspects? Yeah, sure. So it's interesting at the moment, actually, because um, the kind of the job that I'm doing is in a bit of a state of flux because uh, the team I'm in is downsizing and restructuring. So actually, there's a lot of changes going on. But um, since November, basically, I've been in what's called a team leader in the shielding directorate. So in the Ministry of Housing, Communities, Local Government, we have a shielding team, which is which basically set up to sort of um, provide advice and support to local councils on how to support individuals who are shielding. So clearly extremely vulnerable people, the people who are prioritized for the COVID-19 vaccine. And um, that like, covers all sorts of things. It covers um, talking to councils in a particular region. So um, until recently, I was looking after the East Midlands region. So I was the main point of contact between government and councils in the East Midlands. On, the, on what kind of types of support they should be offering clinically extremely vulnerable people. It means holding lots of kind of stakeholder engagement sessions, gathering lots of data, um, working with other government departments about what kind of types of support we can give to people who are shielding, be that financial support, be that sort of um, support in the health system, that sort of thing. So it's quite a complex piece of work because you've got to kind of think about every aspect of um, a person's life if they're shielding. Obviously, it's quite complicated. They won't be able to sort of get to the places they need to get to necessarily. Many of them will have been either furloughed or been working from home like, like you and I are for the past year. So it's thinking about sort of what kind of um, support they need and how to sort of ensure that they can live basically as full and normal a life as possible. And uh, more recently, of course, making sure they get access to the vaccine if they want it and trying to reintroduce them back into society and make sure they have a basic level of support as we hopefully get back to some sort of normality. Well, that sounds like you've been doing some tremendously important work over the course of the last year, um, really making a huge contribution alongside a lot of other people to, to helping us fight, fight the, COVID, this, the, the pandemic that we're suffering from. It's really great that you've taken the time away from that to speak to us. In general, working in the civil service, what are some of the things that you enjoy about it? Um, sounds like it's been quite serious over the last year but but have there been moments yeah. which have been more satisfying yeah absolutely i mean um i absolutely love working in the civil service um and there are you know like in all jobs there are positive and negatives but in my opinion the positives always outweigh the negatives in my particular field i think um in the civil service there is obviously such a broad kind of there's a, a sort of a, a serious breadth of the kind of work that's going on across all different types of government departments so i mean um you could be doing something like, for example, shielding work one day, and then you could be looking at, for example, how to sort of um, uh, how to feed into the government's net zero emissions agenda by decarbonizing the heating of you know, domestic kind of buildings, that kind of stuff. There's all sorts of things and everything in between. So I think the variability of kind of the work of government is, for me, something very interesting. If you have a kind of even a vague interest in sort of current affairs, I think um, a job in the civil service is particularly advantageous. I think um, there's also sort of, I think, a genuine sort of um, opportunity and chance if you're working in the civil service to make a real difference to people's lives sometimes. Obviously, it doesn't always go that way. Um, we're very much constrained by sort of, you know, um, sort of the democratic process. We have to make sure that ministers agree with our recommendations. Ministers are the ones who decide on actual policies. But I mean, um, those are kind of the big, big positives. And on top of that as well, I've got absolutely fantastic colleagues who sometimes work with some of the sharpest minds in the country, particularly when we sort of bring experts in the house to help us because help inform particular policies with the data and the evidence we need. So that's always really exciting. On the kind of negative side, I guess I've kind of touched on it a little bit, sort of um, if you're particularly passionate about certain issues, um, you know, 
be that homelessness, be that, you know, sort of um, social care, be that whatever it may be, it can sometimes be a bit frustrating that you feel like you're, we're not going far enough with certain recommendations or with certain ideas. So I think being a civil servant, you've got to sort of manage expectations. You've got to sort of um, stick to the art of the possible. And I think that can be difficult for some people. Um, on top of that, I think um, the other thing, which it can be a positive, but it can also be a negative, is um, there's a lot of uncertainty. And you could be asked to move around quite quickly and adapt to things very quickly. So as I mentioned earlier, I am currently in the process of being moved from my current role, which was kind of engaging with councils in the East Midlands region to leading on what's called the funding policy. So I'm basically going to be the one talking to the Treasury to get to make sure we have the right funds and the right money in place for councils to help support clinically extremely vulnerable people. And I was only asked to do that last week. So at the drop of a hat, you can quickly move into quite a sort of... Um, uh, unfamiliar area which can be quite daunting but I think um, that's part and parcel of being in the civil service you have to be willing to sort of move around and sort of take the roll of the punches and take the rough and the smooth. That's absolutely fascinating I, I recognize some I guess of those things that you've just said in my own role uh, as an academic particularly that sometimes you can be really passionate about something but you can't always make something happen and also that sense that there is a lot of uncertainty particularly around funding applications and whether grants are going to go ahead and I, th I think those are two things that come into a lot of different fields um, and then it's not really great to hear you pull them out because I think that they're quite important for students to hear that those things happen throughout your career it's not something necessarily just limited to some particular sectors um so uh how did you get into your current role how did you go from being an archaeology undergraduate with us here in york uh through to working for the civil service yeah it's a great question i think um i think growing up and particularly sort of just before i went to university and whilst i was at york doing sort of my archaeology undergraduate degree i always felt that sort of um i should have had a better idea of what i wanted to do with my life i never really knew what i wanted to do growing up obviously Kind of you know i have my parents and sort of you know various other people like teachers for example saying you know oh, you should do x y or z you know you should be a lawyer you should be this kind of the, the usual kind of things and i never really kind of warmed any of those ideas and to be honest i probably wasn't really aware of what the civil service did or you know uh, sort of um what a, a kind of like what a civil servant's life and job life would entail until probably i got into sort of the second or third year of my phd so after I did my archaeology undergraduate, I was kind of, you know, hopelessly bereft of ideas. I wasn't entirely sure what I wanted to do. I know I particularly enjoyed being in academia. Um, I wanted to sort of, I guess, kind of develop the skills that I'd learned in my archaeology degree slightly further. So I did a master's degree in history and politics, contemporary history and international politics, again at York. So I switched over to the history department. And after that, again, um, I wasn't entirely sure what I wanted to do with my life. So I kind of decided to go continue down the academic route. Um, and, I, I, and I suppose for a while, sort of towards the end of my um, undergraduate and my master's and the beginning of my PhD, I think I assumed I would become an academic. You know, I think that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be sort of, you know, a sort of a researcher or a lecturer or something like that. So I went into the PhD and I guess a couple of years into the PhD, I kind of realized that sort of, um, perhaps sort of the academic lifestyle wasn't for me for various reasons. I mean, um, there's so many great things about being a lecturer, being a researcher, but I think um, I was particularly interested in, I think, sort of a more practical application of my skills sort of in wider society almost. I think there's many advantages to being sort of an academic, but I think sometimes it can feel a bit like a closed shop. Um, so I kind of, um, my PhD was on British foreign policy towards um, the EEC, so the precursor to the EU, European Economic Community. And in that work, I interviewed quite a few sort of uh, diplomats, foreign office diplomats, the head of the um, foreign office and also the head of the French foreign ministry. And I kind of got a bit of an interest in the kind of work they were doing. And I kind of thought, OK, so, you know, the kind of jobs that they had, the kind of sort of tasks they've been given sounded kind of interesting, kind of appealed. So towards the end of my PhD, I started to sort of look at civil service jobs literally just on the uk civil service jobs website nothing fancy you know kind of like you know fancy research just went straight onto the civil service jobs website kind of looked at a few jobs that took my fancy and started sending out applications and um obviously you know got a few rejections first of all as, as to be expected they're very competitive jobs 
but I kept at it and sort of eventually managed to get my first job in the civil service, which I started in June 2018. Fantastic. And I think um, there are several things just to, that we get asked a lot of questions about um, mm. uh, from students coming coming to us and also from our own students. One is just to say that when you finished your degree, you moved into history and politics. And I think that's something a lot of students come to archaeology. They're not really sure about whether there is that crossover between history and politics, but that absolutely is. And that the kind of studying that you're doing archaeology, if you then decide you do want to move more towards history, then, then that's possible. But I, I also like I find it really fascinating how um, uh, this sense that you wanted to make a contribution and that led to you mm. finding this particular area. I know a lot of our students we talk to, they want to be able to give back to society. They want to be, a, you know, making a difference. And I think that journey that you've been on, I think will speak to a lot of students in that sense that you're really passionate about doing research. And I think you've probably found an area to work in where that passion for research can be applied to making a difference mm. within people's within people's lives. That's really lovely to hear. So can I ask you a little bit about um, what kind of skills do you think archaeology gave you to support you in, in this career? Uh, what are the, some of the things that, that you took from your degree, either specifically at York or just broadly in terms of, of studying archaeology? Yeah, for sure. So I think the first thing I'd say is obviously it's quite fashionable nowadays to kind of like bash higher education in general i think um a lot of sort of you know people in sort of the media say oh you know more more young people should be doing apprenticeships which of course is absolutely fine and too many people are going to university that may that may also be true and sort of you know um too many people are coming out of university without kind of the real skills they need to kind of um apply themselves in the workplace um i've honestly not found that to be the case i strongly kind of skeptical critical of the argument although i think it has some merits i think one of the big things i noticed is that sort of um whilst an archaeology degree obviously is sort of um it's, it's the way we kind of think about sort of going into the workplace we may think you if you want to be an archaeologist you do an archaeology degree if you want to be a historian or a history teacher you do a history degree and so on and so forth actually the way i think the world of work uh, works in practice is there are some basic fundamental skills which most degrees will teach you, which you need in the workplace. So when I did my archaeology degree, I guess I built and developed on some quite basic skills sites, such as like kind of research, critical evaluation, sort of being able to analyze information quickly, being able to sort of, I guess, pick apart arguments um, and sort of construct your own arguments in, in response. Also, so to a certain extent, sort of being able to present, so public speaking to a, to a certain extent, being able to sort of um, kind of um, speak with authority, work with other people sort of in a team, those basic building blocks, which you do in your archaeology degree. Um, when I was at York, I'm not sure if the, um, if you still do, but there was the team project module where we you worked on a project module. Yeah, where you work together in a small team to deliver a particular piece of work. You do that in the workplace literally every day. That happens every day in the workplace. So I think um, I'm very skeptical about sort of the kind of the argument that, that higher education does not prepare you for workplace. It absolutely does. It just um, does it in a way where it teaches you the basic skills that you need in certain environments, rather than perhaps the specific knowledge on the job, specific sort of knowledge about sort of, um, you know, sort of how to write a submission for ministers, let's say, or how to sort of put in a spending bid to the treasury. You don't need to know that before you start a job in the civil service. You can learn that on the job. Yeah, um, I completely agree with you uh, that those kind of critical thinking skills. And I think one of the things that is particularly unique about studying archaeology is those team working skills alongside mm. kind of working on your own. Like as archaeologists, first you're thrown into the field in your first year and expected to get along with everybody. And then as you talked about the team projects where you are applying a skill you're writing a professional report it really gives you a chance to test out some of your different team working skills Absolutely. so can i just finish by asking what are your top tips then for anyone who wanted to follow in your footsteps if there's a student watching this who's doing an archaeology degree and thinks i would love to work for the civil service what is your advice yes i think um I've got a few bits of advice, I think. I think at the moment, it's probably no big secret that things are pretty bleak, sort of economically, um, and, that, and that's unfortunate. Um, but I think there are also some positive positives that can be taken. I mean, um, 
first of all, I think the one thing I really wish I'd known, I think when I was younger, when I was sort of striking out trying to find a job is don't sort of um, be too um, kind of disheartened by failure. I mean, I, I think about sort of, I applied for, I think, 45 jobs, roughly, before I got the one that I <clears throat> wanted um, sort of in the civil service. And that took a lot of rejection, in, in particular being turned down for jobs that perhaps I thought that I was right for. And that can be hard. And I think it's important to not take that personally, be really, really persistent. I think um, I had this quite naive expectation that I would find the perfect job, the one perfect job. I put in an application for that, I'd get it and that would be it. In reality, I think um, a lot of job applications could be a numbers game. And by that, I mean, you can see a job which you think you're perfect for, and you know you put in an application, but the, tr the trouble is 500 other people have applied and you can't really stand out from the crowd. Then you might see a second job, which you kind of think is kind of okay, not great, but not terrible, but you think you'd be fairly interested in it. And you apply and only 10 other people apply. Suddenly you've got a much, much better chance of getting it. So trial and error, casting your uh, net as far and as wide as possible, keeping uh, being pers as persistent as possible is really, really important. Because I mean, um, I think particularly in the modern jobs market, we obviously, we hear all these horror stories about, you know, people applying for dozens of jobs and not hearing anything back. Um, it is a harsh reality, I'm afraid, that, that I have to face, and I think many people will have to face. You won't necessarily just walk into the dream job you wanted immediately. You've got to be persistent. So um, that's one key bit of advice. I suppose a second bit of advice I'd give is that sort of um, when it came to the civil service, you don't necessarily need any relevant experience as such. I certainly didn't have that much when I applied. It obviously helps if you can find sort of some sort of relevant experience which is relevant to the work of government but i think any type of work experience where you can show that um, sort of you're kind of like a, a relatively well like well-rounded person if you like i think employers are putting an increasing emphasis on that more and more so i guess um you know there used to be this kind of perception that you went to university and you walked straight into a job you didn't have to have any work experience it's not like that anymore really you need to have a good degree of course extracurricular interests you know for example societies at the university that kind of thing um but also a bit of work experience be that working in sort of like you know a supermarket you know i worked at clinton's cards during my undergraduate sort of you know not particularly glamorous but it just gave me a bit of work experience to pad out my cv it taught me sort of basic skills like interacting with the public or customers working in a team sort of that sort of thing personal responsibility that kind of stuff you know and self-confidence so i guess just a small amount of work experience it doesn't matter what it is you'd be surprised how much it teaches you to sort of then progress to what you might consider to be sort of um, a more complex job so i mean um and going back to sort of the point about university societies i mean it, it might sound a bit daft but i mean i was secretary for the university of york archaeology society and obviously that sounds you know like you're like well so what 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 what, what possible relevance is that but um the kind of work i did which was kind of you know updating sort of the membership database sort of um, sending out communications each week the kind of like weekly newsletters to society members organizing events that kind of thing you will do that in pretty much any office job it might be slightly different but the kind of basics are exactly the same so i think getting a breadth of experience across academia work and extracurricular activities very important and then sort of um, i suppose it's having the confidence to then apply for those jobs and be persistent, as I said before. Thank you so much. I think there's some fantastic advice in there. Um, and we really recognize um, the confidence, I think, in our students that comes both with them taking on responsibilities in societies and those jobs that you think might not have that much relevance, a retail job or a bar job that you have to support yeah. yourself while at university. It teaches you a whole range of skills and it's about putting that whole package together you seem to be saying that 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 really matters thank you so much for joining us today adam and giving us some insight into the really important work that you've been doing over the past year but also working in the civil service uh, more broadly i can definitely see how research skills developed in both in your your archaeology degree and in in a, in a history and politics uh, masters and phd can really apply to that to that field as well
Um, thank you very much to everyone who's joined us for today's uh, talk. Uh, join us next time for more top tips for archaeology graduates. Thank you.